And for me, what was really special is I could make a difference today, race it tomorrow, or even make a difference with the setup of the car and see it race. And you get this instant feedback. You've done a good job or a bad job. Instant. And that hooked me completely. Welcome to the Your Data Driven Podcast. If you like this podcast, be sure to visit our website at yourdatadriven.com for more useful help and advice on setting up your race car, mastering data analysis, and driving faster. Welcome to episode 51. This show is a second part of a very special two-parter with Willem Toad, former head of aerodynamics from Benetton, Ferrari, Sauber, and BAR Formula 1 teams. Be sure to listen to part one if you missed it. But without further ado, let's carry on from where we left off last time. Grab a pen, grab a coffee, sit back, and let's enjoy what else William has to say. And I suppose that's where that's where the reader question came in, really, because I suppose there's so many things you could do, and I, I guess as a hierarchy of things where to start with, you know, what's going to be the most efficient. Yeah. I think that's where what he was getting at. It's like, well, where do I start? Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that's fascinating. It's, it's to have that kind of that quantum, I'm, I'm all about the data and it's about quantifying some of the, uh, this intuition because intuition, like yeah. so, but that, that's amazing how much of a difference that makes on yeah. the suspension. So now if you're generating downforce with a wing and you want the maximum you can get, if you want very efficient downforce, you still want your tufts to be everywhere relatively smooth. But if you're starting to approach the maximum, then probably the last 20% of your, let's say, rear wing element yeah. actually should be separated and should be well, should be very turbulent to get the very maximum power from a rear wing. Oh. So if you plaster a rear wing with, um, with tufts, your main plane should be fine, your flat can afford then to have, say, the last 20% with quite a lot of turbulence. That's absolutely fine. But that's a deep knowledge of aerodynamics needs to tell you that you can't, you, that's not intuitive at all. No. Yeah. I guess, yeah, you do need, I suppose, the measurement off the other side to sort of, to see that. And yeah, the forces. Yeah, was that stumbled across by accident by any chance? Because you, you No, <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. It's, if you study wing theory or you study wing profiles, yeah. there are certain laws of physics that were understood in Germany and in America in particular, but the Americans uh, invented a series of profile, profiles called NACA profiles, and they went through and did wind tunnel testing with a series of profiles, neutral and cambered. So a neutral profile is the same top and bottom. A cambered profile is like the same if you imagine a teardrop shape and then you bend it. Yep. Yeah, so that you end up with, instead of having an, uh, a neutral profile, you have a cambered profile. Understood. So that would be, uh, you know, just take a, take a neutral profile, nice nice rounded leading edge, tapering down, and then you bend it. Clear. That has camber. And when you do wind tunnel experiments, you learn that for all neutral elements, the amount of downforce they generate is directly linked to the angle of attack. Directly linked. There is a direct link. And what the shape of the of the aerofoil is actually doesn't matter. It's almost irrelevant, apart from skin friction. Isn't that weird? That is not that is not normal. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I literally I'm 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 sponging this information out there. I'm like, what? Because yeah, everything I've known so far is that oh, there's so much goes into the profile of these wings, but there is. That, is it is it in that but, sort of an optimization of the skin friction and 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 trying to minimize yeah. that part of it rather than yeah. the actual? And then if you have a cambered wing, yeah. So and then so there is this linear relationship between angle and power. Wow. Okay. And that is relative relative to the onset flow. Yeah. Which may not be horizontal. If it's on a car, it will not be horizontal. Well, that's, that's the, the other assumption, isn't it? That, yeah. That's the other. That's another. And then the next thing that happens is if you have a cambered section, then a cambered section like this, yeah. horizontal, will produce, in this orientation, will produce downward force. I'm, I'm sort of zero degrees, 
And so it doesn't matter whether it's flowing from left or right or right to left, it'll produce some downforce. Yes. And then if it's coming if it's coming from this side, if the air is coming from this side, there'll be an angle of attack where you produce zero downforce, maybe something like this. And then from that angle where you produce zero downforce, you start to change the angle and you go to exactly the same amount of downforce per unit angle as you get with a neutral section at an angle. You just have an offset of the angle. Oh, yes. So a cambered section produces more downforce than a neutral section. Cool. Hey, it's brilliant. So how, how, have you? Yeah. I've got a question for you about the um, the education side of things for you because you mentioned that a couple of times. So did you find that almost an advantage, or did you turn it into an advantage of the fact that you were still you're kind of learning on the job in effect, and so. To, to satisfy yourself, you had to make it, visualize it, or did you did you sort of study, yeah. go off and do some studying and sort of catch up a bit with your peers, or, or I don't know, how, how did you cope with, with that? So if I could give my younger self good advice, it would be go back and study the theory a bit more often, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but my attitude meant I had... I developed, if you like, a deep physical understanding for what was going on, yeah. even though I didn't have the theory. And when I now, so I've now gone back and studied the theory in order to teach it. And you, So unfortunately, it depends on your perspective and your attitude to your own education. But for some people, needing to know the mathematics to study aerodynamics is a disadvantage and I, th I believe in aerodynamics, if you want to solve the most difficult problems you have, you need a number of people with great theoretical skills, but you also need a number of people with, if you like, the intuition. It, no, that's maybe the wrong word. The artistic ability to just jump into different areas. You know, how do you use theory to tell you when... I want to add a new element to this vehicle to make it improve. How do you know how to do that? Yeah. That's quite... Now, I have the techniques that I teach. There's a creative part to it there, I suppose. It's, there is a creative side. For sure, there's a creative side. So Oppenheimer it comes to mind. I, the, I don't know if you've seen the film, uh, yeah. but yeah, he had this... The, you know, the, I haven't yet, and, but yeah. Well, so so the, the, the story, uh, uh, it's not going to spoil it for you, but he, he wasn't very good at algebra, but he was quite good at imagining what was going on in the atoms and, and such like, more better than the people yeah. who could do the algebra. You just can prove it. So as a yeah. team, they, you know, they all sort of play to their strengths, as it were, and yeah. the, the guys who could do them and so proved it. In my career, I'd say that lack, lack of theoretical background understanding of aerodynamics has been both an advantage and a disadvantage. My practical experimenting side was an advantage, especially in early days. Where honestly, when we were starting, it, all you needed, you didn't need to know aerodynamics when I was starting aerodynamics. You needed to know rate of change of shape versus rate of change of performance. And you just keep going until you've gone too far and you come back a bit. <laughs> and then you move to the next element. Yeah. And then we were, I was really quick at, as soon as someone else had an idea, I was very quick at trying to imagine what the hell is that doing? What on earth is that doing? And so examples were, Barge boards invented by McLaren. They tested it before they went racing. By the time they got to the first race with their new idea, barge boards, Benetton had them. Who, who because, have you worked for? So just, just for the for the, for the sake, just as rolling, we we haven't got that far yet. But like, but we might as well, you know, do it now. So uh, just for the for the for the, so for the people I, listening, you know, you have spent a bit of time in Formula One. Thirty. You? I was I was thirty. I was thirty-two years of age when I got my first Formula One job. That was 1985, and it was with the Tolman Group. Tolman Group were bought by Benetton, first sponsored by them, bought by Benetton, so that became Benetton. From there, we won the World Championship, won the first World Championship. We designed the, I did, I'd worked on the design of the uh, second World Championship car, and then got poached and went to Ferrari. Went to Ferrari, built their new wind tunnel that they still use. They had a really small one in Maranello, built a state of the art wind tunnel, and left to go to BAR even before Honda, but BAR. In life, you make decisions. If you know it's a life-changing decision, 
it's an easy decision for me to make if I know it's life-changing, because you consider it well. Some life-changing decisions you knowingly make are good ones. Some. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, BAR Honda. And then from there, I went to BMW Sauber. Now, in the Benetton time, I took a little break. And at Benetton, Flavio Briatore took on John Barnard. I was loyal to Rory Byrne, who was the chief designer. He was still in charge. He was, a, he was effectively technical director, but we didn't have anyone called a technical director. And so a whole bunch of us left Benetton, designed our own car that was aimed at, was intended to be a Reynard Formula One car. But I was a member of the board, along with uh, people like Pat Simmons and Rory Byrne and Adrian Reynard. We were the board. We couldn't secure a factory engine deer. We couldn't secure a title sponsor. And so we just agreed to fold the company. And then Rory Byrne, to his credit, rather than get a job for Rory Byrne, he went hunting for a job for his whole team. We went, all of us, back to Benetton. And Barnard was asked to... And Flavio learned a lot from that too. A good friend of mine just wrote a book on that Benetton story, uh, um, which which uh, I got for Christmas. I'm halfway through it, so I've got that far into the story. Well, he hasn't spoke. He hasn't spoken to me, so he's missing some bits. But, but anyway, that have you read matter. it? Have you read it? No, I haven't read it. It's, it's very yeah. large, very I much. Will. I will. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I I will read it because for me it was really interesting. Rory would ask, "How much budget do we have?" And he would look to the best way to spend it. Barnard would think would gather information, how much do we need? He would add a zero on the end, stomp his feet and demand that. And when he only got half of it, he had five times what he needed to do a great job and every excuse in the book. <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That brilliant. Now, that's an exaggerated, potted um, <laughs> yeah, philosophy, but there are quite different philosophies between different designers, yeah, different experts. Yeah. And they're, they're good life lessons too, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to get just that little bit more grip from your tyres? To have complete confidence that you're setting the ideal tyre pressures for your car, your driving style, the track you're on, even the session type you're competing in. And what if you knew exactly what to do, no matter what the weather threw at you? Join the hundreds of pro and am drivers and engineers who've taken the Master Your Tires program. Become my test driver in training, follow my step-by-step -step guides, and learn how to apply the included pro-grade smart run sheet. You will discover how to design practical experiments that will help you to precisely set up your tires every single time. You can finally fill in the blanks and develop a more complete mental model of tire mechanics. What makes them happy? What doesn't? All in bite-sized video lessons and presented from the driver's perspective. Visit tirecourse.com to learn more about how to get more grip and more performance from the only part of your car that touches the racetrack. I'm so sorry. I, I did jump in there on that one, but I just thought it'd be interesting for people to know a bit more of your history yep. there. But um, and so yeah, so you put the you put the board straight onto onto the Benetton at that point, having seen them on the McLaren. Yep. So, like the barge boards on yep. there, but I guess you did put yep. them on there without understanding how they work. But it uh, no, it was we had a wind tunnel program, got a fax with the with a conceptual shape, looked around for some material we could use to put on the model, found a bit of aluminium cut something out, bent it round an oxyacetylene tube, a, a cylinder to get the rough shape we wanted, made a few aluminium brackets. By the second run in the wind tunnel, it was better. We had worse cooling for better performance. By the time we'd spent a day and a half, we were 5% more downforce. It was like, wow, these things look like they send air away from the, from the floor of the car, and they actually send more floor air in. And then that was when I, you get the wool tuft and you have a look, what the heck is going on? These, they look in plan view like they're deflecting air away, yet the, the, the pressure sensors on the floor say, I'm getting more air to the floor. And what happens is you roll a vortex up that takes air that's coming along beside the barge boards and pushes that air down and underneath. This is the clever bit really of the air, that I, that, That's when my mind just goes a little bit crazy because you're, you're trying to get the air into a tunnel in effect, and that sort of energizes it. And that's basically all I know. It's just literally like 
okay, that's it's, that's a bit 3D. That's getting quite clever for me. Now. Yeah. So I do have I do have a couple of posts on um, motorsport.com's oh, cool. um, YouTube channel about front wings and the Y250 Vortex. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. The Y250. And this one, isn't it? The the that's where I tried to explain a little bit, and it, it comes down to air can't go through a solid object and so it tries to find its only it was okay it's not correct to say that it's using intelligence but it it can't go through an object it's forced to take another path and that creates these vortices that then can be used and the when you see a vortex core say from a rear wing or you used to be able to see the y250 vortex but certainly even today well today they've also with the rounded rear wing end plates they tried to get rid of the wire, the, the tip vortex off a wing as well but you would sometimes see that but that vortex that's the core you see and what you actually see is you see humidity in air being condensed into droplets that are big enough that you can actually see them and so that's just changing pressures cause the water, the humidity to just condense into tiny droplets. That's why you see it. But that that vortex is much bigger than the core you can see. So you start imagining, okay, you see this little core, but what happens to the air that's out here? It's being rotated more slowly, but it's also being rotated. And the Y250 vortex would take air that would normally just pass above the front wing, and it would rotate it inward and downward, and then downward and outward, but it would, you would, it would rotate it inward and downward and downward enough that it would actually go underneath the floor of the car. And you ram a load of extra air under the floor of the car. Very cool. That is, yeah. I was just thinking that through. But that, yeah, so I've only seen the little, the little ones. But yeah, so you're, yeah. it's a whole, it's, it's the whole body, the whole mass of air, I suppose, is all, all ripping. Yeah, it's being rotated. So being, if you just imagine, yeah. if you take, a small amount of air and you, you swirl that, it's going to have an influence on the parcels of air near that and, and will create slower. And so that's what happens. You get those interactions. Air is incredibly interactive. So I suppose that I've got one little question here for you, which, so I'm a, a suspension guy, if anything. And when the the new rules came out in Formula One with the, the, uh, the underfloor, requirements the the red bull came out with what i thought was quite an interesting front suspension um with quite a lot of what looks like anti-dive on it and i was trying to work out why they would do that because yet again dynamics is compromised i think for aerodynamics but all i could all i could figure out was they were just trying to they were trying to hold or control the front of that floor in a particular way so it's almost like you move the the pitch center of the car a little bit and make it stiffer so for different ride heights you could the virtual stiffness of that point on the car doesn't really change. So you can do all sorts of things, but that point isn't going to really move. And I just wondered whether that was a thing or whether I'd made yeah. that up or whether that was important, that that front of the floor edge or whether whether it's the back and, and, and the stuff that's coming from the back. It's both. Coming through. I don't know. It's both. The design that the, the rule makers came up with, now they had limited resources to design a completely new set of aerodynamic regulations, which is really tough. And then every team had more than 10 times that resource to try and find a way around it. Yeah. But they had limited resource trying to develop this uh, set of regulations. And they developed regulations that were actually quite sensitive to height, front and rear. Oh. And so if you can stabilize the front, you have more you have a more stable aero platform. There's a lot more to it than that. Uh, yeah, I imagine. <laughs> I imagine. Now I'll, I I want to pop back to using resources. So with my lifetime experience, I got a job at the Sauber Group and I've worked for the Sauber Group three times. Been fired twice, but I work I've been hired three times. Long story, but in in a senior position, in a company that's not doing particularly well, and in Sauber's case, it was BMW withdrew. That was the first time. They needed to reduce the size of the company so that Peter Sauber could buy it back and not have a salary bill that was simply going to drain his entire fortune in the first year. And so BMW had to cut it down. And I was actually really grateful to be made redundant. Officially, they call it made redundant. I was very really grateful to be made redundant 
when I'm being asked in one afternoon to tell more than half my department they're redundant. You have a department, let's say, in round numbers, 100 people. And to run a Formula One team, you need to build the car and run the car. What can you cut out? You cut out what you feel is the luxury, which is the research. Now, the research is what gives you the performance. Of course. But if you can't afford to pay your salaries, you've got to do something and you've got to get the car to the grid every race. So Peter was left with few choices. And so I was very grateful, to be honest, when I'm telling half my department and I couldn't even give them the dignity of telling them one to one. There was not the time. So you have to have groups and you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. And, I didn't, and there's no time to explain. You've got what the other a, a lunchtime meeting. I'm really sorry to say. Uh, well, we're really happy to say the company's going to be saved. Peter Sauber's buying it back, but there are going to be extensive redundancies. And when I'm telling half my family, because they're like my family, that I'm just about to make their lives hell, yeah. um, it's quite nice that I'm also in a position where I don't have somewhere to go to. I also have to look. Yeah. And then 18 months later, they called me back, and then. Uh, Sauber went through a long period of very little funding and uh, Monisha Kaltenborn was running the company. She did an amazing job of keeping it just alive, just surviving, just. But eventually you have to blame someone for the performance and eventually after a couple of technical directors and chief designers and head of vehicle performance, eventually head of error had to be on the list. So it was my turn. And then I, I now work for them a little bit as a consultant. And to be honest, Formula One, I'm now over 70. Formula One, to do it well, I would only do it if you do if I did it well. To do it well, I don't believe you can do that job, let's say, in part-time-ish capacity. And I relish the idea of passing on knowledge. But I will now come back to Formula One access. So wind tunnel testing, I started one week in, three weeks out. You eventually get to, uh, eventually you build your own wind tunnel. You start to do full-time occupation of the wind tunnel, then full-time two shifts, then full-time three shifts. Then you start thinking, okay, 24-7. Now, I resisted at the point of 24-7, but I've worked all my life about just making it more efficient. And so I would work on how much time do we need at each attitude? Can we go to continuous motion and acquisition? How can I speed up the time between pressing the go button and the wind speed and the road speed being on, on target? So I actually one remember of the... years ago, I went. To, I listened to a talk of yours a couple of years ago, maybe a couple more than a couple, and it was when the limits had come in on the wind tunnel. And you said, yeah, so, well, the wind tunnel typically starts in a really consistent way. So it takes a little while to get up to speed with the wind. So how can we use that startup time? And and with a bit of maths, you can kind of, you know, work it out. And it was like, yeah, genius. So a genius. wind tunnel, a that. wind tunnel will be, <laughs> a wind tunnel will be built with a closed loop control system to allow you to run to any speed. And you will approach the target speed. You'll inevitably overshoot. The wind tunnel is. 25 meters away from where the working section is in terms of airline. So it takes a bit of time for it all to settle. And so you overshoot and then the speed sort of settles down here. Yeah? And then the cooling system comes in and it's out of phase a little bit with the speed. But because we started in a consistent way, we saved more than 30 seconds. The first attempt, it wasn't me that did it, it was one of my geniuses, which was just given the task of looking at the problem and finding a way to shorten the time. We were doing 350 runs every week. Half a minute, just on building up the wind speed, half a minute, 350 times. Yeah, you've got 100, 180 minutes extra. You've got three hours, you say. Shit. Boom. Yeah. You may know that at the end of season one, I wrote the Motorsports Playbook, a summary distilling the first 20 shows into nuggets of wisdom. I made the notes so that you don't have to. If you've not got it yet, go and grab yourself a copy from the website. 
and that's that's what I love about motorsport. I just, I just love that yep. um, that thing. I've done a bit of work, well, quite like, a decade or so in Olympic sport, and one of the reasons Ooh, I was there, uh -huh. yes, well, you know, um, uh, to try try and help out a little bit. And one of the what, my contribution to that world was helping them with the data and the numbers and uh, stuff that they already have, but just sort of making it more efficient and visualizing what they were doing. But yep. it was it w wasn't until I sort of stepped out of what in effect we might take for granted into a different environment where they're still competing, but they 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 weren't they, they weren't that wasn't ingrained in their, their mindset to sort of go oh actually we could do this more efficiently by just doing that well no we'll just yeah. keep on turning the handle that's my job yeah and it was like you don't have to do that by the way you could automate that bit <laughs> and they're like oh so <laughs> I, I I would say I made a significant contribution to the fact that. Aero testing is restricted simply because people who left Sauber and went to other teams complained bitterly about how inefficient they were compared to what Sauber had, and people were other teams were scared of just how fast we were able to get stuff done. An alternative solution was Toyota, who went twenty four seven with their wind tunnel and decided they needed more, so they built a second wind tunnel. <laughs> the Salba wind tunnel cost 55 million euros. The Mercedes wind tunnel cost 25 million pounds. Wow. I worked on, I worked on efficiency, and I balked at seven days a week. Most people on the planet have some religion that they believe in, and it doesn't as a boss, it doesn't matter to me what people's religion is. It doesn't matter to me whether they are or are not religious, purely speaking as a boss. What matters to me is I get a job done and my people are stable and happy. I don't know anyone who's going to stay stable and happy when you make them work seven days a week for a month, for example. You need time away. Yeah. And I reasoned if I left Sundays aside and we had an emergency, you at least had a 24-hour period spare that could be used in an emergency to solve a problem. You have a breakage in the tunnel, but you've got deadlines to meet with releasing designs for manufacture and so on. Then I just did not want to go 24-7, 24-6 I went for and I worked hard on efficiency. Yeah. And unfortunately, the payback was the rule makers came in with the help of all the other teams who were scared of what we were achieving and slowed us down. And now you can do so few runs is ridiculous. And teams and but teams will take a ridiculous amount of time thinking about the results before they move to the next test because they now can. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a waste of a resource, but that, yeah. Now, I'm hoping that with a budget cap, we can eventually talk sense to the teams where they take away some of these restrictions. It'll take a long time on aero because aerodynamics is so powerful. So with aerodynamics, a Formula One car goes approximately, if you say, took away the downforce and then reduced the drag dramatically. Let's say you reduced the drag to 30% of what it is today. You would probably go 22 or 23 seconds a lap slower than you do today on an average circuit. Yeah. It's huge. And that's why you make these terrible compromises for suspension and and all and in the days uh, in the days up to 22, the really high rear center of gravity height with the high ride heights was clearly negative from a from a mechanical grip perspective or mechanical handling perspective. But it made such a difference to the low speed to high speed aerodynamic balance that you were better off that way. Just get on with it. <laughs> it's kind of an idea. <laughs> so I've got, I've got, I'm just looking at the time, conscious of the time and taking up too much of yours. Uh, just wrapping up, in, 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 just to sort of pull that together back into the into the world of, you know, the amateur paddock and thinking of all those is summing up all of those that sort of resource and that creativity and thinking about approaching things in a different way. I can't ignore the arrow now, obviously, because it's so no, powerful, but at the same time, 
Uh, there are restrictions in many in many series and one make series and and such like on purpose. But if you have one or two things that people were thinking about, or, or if you were advising someone in a panic and it's like, okay, well, you might want to try that kind of thing, or even the simple things, or just a thinking through something. I mean, have you got any final thoughts on? Uh, on so I would experience? say, yep, I do. One thing I would say, if you're into motorsport and you're thinking about aerodynamic modifications, perhaps go to a British hill climb championship round. I've been hill climbing in the UK for a long time, have given a great deal of advice to hill climbers, and they've used my advice, their own research, back-to-back testing, and discussions with other experts, and they have freedom of regulation that you maybe don't have in other categories. So if you look at the standard category, the standard formula categories, they are either made to a budget and you're not allowed to touch them, yep. or they are uh, restricted very severely in what you can touch. Yep. You go to hill climbing and the aerodynamic regulations are freer. And British hill climb cars are very good aerodynamically, yep. even on average. Everybody has asked questions They've all been given the same honest advice. They've had different capabilities. They've then done their own research. They've used other experts as well. And so there's some something to do there. Then a floor with diffuser can be fitted to almost any car if the rules allow. And it's going to be the most efficient thing you can do. I have some articles on LinkedIn and on Racetech magazine about how motorsport diffusers work. Either one will work. There's more information on Racetech Magazine's website than there is on LinkedIn, but but the LinkedIn post has better images initially and then has a link to the Racetech Magazine article. Well, if you're okay, I can, That's can link them in the show notes if you're happy about that. Sure. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, it's just how motorsport diffusers work, Willem Toet, a Google search will find them. But it's easy. And... That's going to be the most efficient device. Then anything else needs a little bit more, a tiny bit more work and imagination. But I think looking at what other people have done and talking to them. The other thing I love about hill climbing is it's such a friendly sport. Yeah, You can go and ask the owner of a car what they did and why they did it and how much difference it made. You can ask and they'll talk to you. One ticket gets you everywhere. You can stand over the top of the cars and have a really good look. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, I think actually, I mean, fortunate that people listen from all over the world and there's a general culture, I think, in motorsport. I'm going to say on, on the positive side that, that they are pretty open. I don't think people always, like, people don't necessarily always tell you the truth, but if there's a game to be had on that, um, tire presses, for example, you may not get that out of people. But other things about, yeah how people have approached things or whatever. I think it's, yeah, I think it's it's worth having those conversations and you can kind of try and filter, you know, the answer. And the, But then I think you made the, the main point there is that you go out and try and do it yourself and, and, yeah. and try, but, that you know, do some experiments, but with this in mind, it's like, well, this is what should happen. Let's see, that back to back. So one of the people you spoke to uh, recently is Julian Edgar. Mm, Julian, yeah. He's, a, he's an Aus- Australian guy who... Is not an expert in any particular field of engineering, but he is a dyed-in-the-wool experimenter, very methodical about his experiments. He's he's written books about his experiments. He's got a couple of books out there about aerodynamics. I think they're amazing books because it shows how he can make gains with just one step at a time, literally one step at a time. Amazing documentation of all that work that he's done. I agree. He's a very Absolutely. determined human being. Yes, he was very determined on the show, actually, as well. <laughs> um, but very generous as well with his, with his thoughts and, uh, and what he shared. It was so practical. You just literally just like do the exercise yeah. and, and go away and do it. So it, was, it was a real pleasure yeah. to have him on. And it's been an absolute yeah. pleasure to have you on as well. I, I really thank you so much for for taking the time I knew this is going to be good and um, look I, I just want to say from, from me and from everyone listening thank you very much a pleasure good to talk to you 
So what did you think of that? What an absolute privilege to get Willem on the show. The more I do this, the more I realise that people who have succeeded at the very top are often the most giving with their time and experience. I hope you've got some good notes, ideas and things to try. Be sure to check out all those links in the show notes. Particularly, there's a video on the challenges and solutions that Willem faced while developing the Salva wind tunnel. And frankly, I'm surprised he's allowed to share it in the public domain. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and visit us at yourdatadriven.com.